Um, a, a bit about my story is just I, I, I come from uh, the United States and I grew up in a very, you know, a typical uh, educational, the, the Western model of education, um, which really values um, preparation for a life of, you know, consumption, really, you know, how to make money so that you can buy things, so that you can participate in an economic framework that, that allows you to, to participate in the, the, the current, you know, capitalistic world. Um, and so that's all I knew for, for a while. Um, but then when I was in, when I graduated high school, just by chance, some friends of mine went to Nicaragua in Central America and wanted me to go with them. And I went with them and um, I was very quickly, um, you know, shocked at, at, at what I was experiencing um, by, by interacting with, with villagers and, um, you know, just, just learning things about my country by being in another country, our relationship with the world, but certainly Central America is, um, it's not easy. It's a very painful relationship that I was never told about. Um, and so I was actually very angry and confused. And so when I returned to America, it took me on a journey of, of learning on my own because the school system was not teaching me the true history of the United States. And so I began studying on my own about the history of the US, um, which ultimately led to traveling all over the world, um, to India, to Nepal, to Southeast Asia, throughout Central America, Australia, many places mostly to learn about history and US relationship with the world. And ultimately it, it, it took me down a road of, you know, empire, um, colonization, um, and, and how this relates to education, ultimately. Of course, this is a long story short, but to get to where I think we're interested, this all relates to education. Constantly being aware, wow, I, you know, I ultimately went to university and all of these things, but I was rarely taught what was really going on in the world. Um, and all this time when I'm traveling, especially when I was with indigenous people, whether they were in yeah, India, Nepal, or, or, or North America, for sure, North America too, always I had this feeling, and it was mostly a feeling, but actual tangible reality too, that they knew more than me, a lot, no, a lot more <laughs> about things that really matter, like how to be happy how to use your hands, <laughs> how to raise a family, how to grow food, <laughs> you know, um, how to make sure your ecosystem is healthy for a long time. And these sort of things were never talked to me, ever. <laughs> Where they weren't even talked, in, talked about, much less, you know, taught, right? And so this was always a, a concern of mine, in, increasingly so. So, Eventually, I got interested in farming um, because this was always the, wherever I went, farming and seed seemed to be the core foundation of understanding reality in a sustainable way, which again, this was never taught to me. We never talked about seeds ever, <laughs> you know, in modern society, you don't, you don't have a relationship with food you just go to the store and buy it <laughs> and like you know you don't know but over you know the course of two decades it, it, you can't avoid this incredible relationship that occurs in the change you have when you're always with seed and mostly people who have a a relationship to seed that's sacred and um you know, it's, it's about culture, right? Like, I think a lot, like, like I live in Thailand now, but my friends and family in the United States, 
there is a new interest in seed saving, but it is still usually coming from the same education that is like A plus B equals C and it's all science and it's all, you know, it's not cultural. There's not much of a, a, a spiritual component to it. And one of the things I've really noticed is like, that is absolutely essential. There has to be this spiritual, cultural uh, integration and feeding through some sort of ritual. And that is never happening from where I come from. And certainly is not, it's, it's not even in the conversation amongst educational circles, you know? And so where I am at now, you know, I am trying to, to, to co-create with other people more of a, a school like this, right? Like, um, I live on a seed saving farm now um, where we save seed and we live in community and we build houses out of mud and we, we just try to do everything in the old way. And when we teach our children here or any children in the community, we don't have a curriculum. We don't have classes. We don't have a school. <laughs> Life is the school, right? And I think the, uh, the, the situation in the world now with the focus on how Western education has redefined what education is, this is really challenging for people. They're like, well, what are you doing with your kids? <laughs> it's like living, living life and learning how to be human. And certainly we, we teach like things like how to ask questions, how to know when you need something, how to know what things are what the origins of what things are and the history of those things, not just a political history, but a natural history. Like where, you know, where did the wood come from? Where did, how did, how did a chili seed get all the way to Asia? So much that most Asians I meet think that chilies are from Asia, <laughs> but actually this is a long, incredible story. And if we can remember all of it, we become part of a really big, big story that includes our ancestors and hopefully includes the children we will never see that come into this planet, you know, a hundred years from now. And so we try to create a container of life that, you know, these sorts of thinking and seeing come to be just by living. So we don't teach it, we do it, you know, um, and this is nothing new. This is a special thing. It's just something that I and, and, and others who have been able to travel and exist with more, I would say, intact peoples of the world. That's how they always do it, you know. And it's not until a government aid group or a missionary comes in and is like, you're not educated. <laughs> well, that's, that's arrogant and totally untrue very much educated <laughs> in my experience more than we in the modern world are <laughs> so um yeah that's kind of what we're trying to do here that's the big question right but i think the uh i think the the ultimate uh answer to that is we as educators have to embody that ourselves. We have to be it, you know, we have to, you know, like one term I've, I, I think is useful is in, uh, the Lakota, they're uh, indigenous people in, you know, what is now referred to as the United States. They say you need to be a hollow bone. What that means is so that spirit can move through you and you get out of your head and into your heart, right? And so if we're telling students to do this, but we are not doing this, it's not going to work. And so in order for to have an integration, like right now, I see a lot of, you know, like I just had a talk the other day with the university in um, America, and they are very interested in these sort of thoughts. But at the end of the conversation, they had to admit they couldn't really do it because the foundation of the school is still that colonizer, settler colonizer kind of 
approach that you have to have your your graduate certificate and you have to you know <laughs> all of these like pieces of paper that verify you're an expert in something you actually know nothing about you never did <laughs> so you know this is something we have to be very aware of and i'm amazed at how many people aren't it's like we have to do it we have to be it and so if we're not allowing some sort of you know indigenous ancestry you know some memory that's stored in our dna to actually come out and be us then we will continue just the same old thing modernity is doing so that's a long answer to what you asked but in a nutshell i think the point is we have to we have to do it the school the foundation and the people that are creating the the school or, or whatever you want to call it we have to be it and that means and i think everything like it, it can't just be intellectual like for example we can't like talk about how oh it's so important for you know people to weave or it's so important for people to spin cotton we have to do it <laughs> we have to do it so that that memory of like touching earth and creating beauty with our hands with nature we're doing it we're not just talking about why it's oh it's so sad it's going away but if you're talking about how sad it's going away but you're not doing it <laughs> then you're participating in its extinction and so we have to embody it and be it nah <laughs> again i think it's a it's it's it, our current the modern approach is always there's a problem you find the problem and you fix it <laughs> you know a plus b equals c and it's like this is a, a, a very dangerous thought, I think. It's, 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 it's a, you know, it's a modern thought that comes from a very recent, a very particular method. And it's the same type of education that's created, you know, genetically modified <laughs> seed and, you know, everything else we see in the world today. Genetically modified students <laughs> going into genetically modified corporations. <laughs> you know it's like you have to be it and so we have to teach we have to teach ourselves and our students and our children that the most important thing is imagination and the and and so we have to create a lot of space for silence and 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 spontaneity and imagination and not focus so much on you know memorization of facts that only pertain to a certain topic of course we should learn about history properly you know we should learn the long history of like migration like how did people get from you know the i don't know the altai mountains all the way through europe and then over to america and what went wrong like why what traumatic event happened to make people so angry <laughs> because that's basically why people act the way they do today but they don't remember because history doesn't tell the true story and so the true history does need to be known so there are certain elements of you know history and information that should be taught reading and writing should be taught you know but ultimately if we're going to actually get to the root issue we have to change culture which means, I think, for most modern people, we have to make culture. There is no culture to change. <laughs> you know, when you look at what culture actually is, it's a people's relationship with their seed over time. Most people have zero relationship with seed and therefore no culture. So there's no culture to change. So you have to create a new culture. And the only way to do that is to have a relationship with a place. And so we have to, to really you know, teach people the necessity and, and, and not just in a factual kind of urgent way, but a tone of love. So you fall in love with the place, you fall in love with water, you fall in love with earth, with dirt, with animals, and you, you, you love it and you miss it when it's gone. And when it's destroyed, it hurts. And so we talk of grief, you know, education needs to speak of grief in a good way because that's a sign of being human you know and it's beautiful and you can make beauty out of that emotion and then time 
right? Because again, in modern culture, it's like, we're going to do this. No, you're not. We probably won't see this, but we can create the environment that something can grow and then our children can grow it a little more <laughs> and then our grandchildren a little more. And then maybe in like 400 years, we have an actual culture again. And how beautiful, because then we'll be the ancestors of those people. And then they'll, they'll remember us. <laughs> but, you know, we have to ch change our idea of like, let's do this now. You can't because we're working with nature and nature works slowly. And we should too. <laughs> you know, like for me, here I am, a white man from Illinois in what is currently called the United States, but I'm married to a, a woman from the Mekong region of Laos and we live in Thailand. And now we have this child together. It's like seeds crossing, right? And this is how nature is. It's wild and unpredictable. <laughs> So in a nutshell, to answer your question, I think it's focusing on culture, on making a culture, not solving a problem. You know, for a long time, I was um, very shy and nervous about this. And I felt like I'm not good enough. I'm a white man. How can I ever do anything like this? It's always cultural appropriation. And so I was always afraid to to do any of these things. And I think a, a little bit of that is important so that we do it right and we don't just, you know, steal things, especially for money. But I'm a farmer and I believe in that the land is holy. And I believe that there's a reason for why people that I admire most all over the world, they make rituals. Like they don't just go grow rice. They make a big prayer first. And it's not just a show. They're not like, it's not a performance. They're feeding the earth with song, with prayer, with what they, they wear. They wear beautiful clothes, you know. They do these things, you know. And it's with an intention to feed the sacred energies of the land, of the water, of the air again and again and again wherever i have seen this the land is good and the people are happy <laughs> so it's something i believe in and i think we have to do otherwise you see the world the way it is now where the land is dead all it is is a resource to be extracted <laughs> you know it's not it's the holy mother <laughs> you know it's the it's the goddess of all life, you know, we, we need to be proud of that and exalt that and say that and speak that, you know, nowadays, English is very an interesting language, but we, we, you know, in India, we force everyone to speak English. I think this is, this is really sad because then the English language makes everything dead. You walk past a tree and you're like it, nah, it's not it. <laughs> you wouldn't call a baby it, you know? <laughs> it's living it's like hello goddess mother you know speak to the tree speak to the land so this is something i'm inspired by especially you know from native american too you know it's like when you get your corn you kiss your corn you sing to your corn you welcome the corn home you don't just take it in a machine and like this is very rude to what gives us life and so we want to create more ceremony to, to make ourselves remember why we are able to live. And there's certain agreements that allow us to continue living in a good way. And if those things don't happen, then you have polluted air, you have polluted water, you have sad people too, right? Because you will see of everywhere. I have no exception for this. Anywhere I have seen people who actually are not only farming, but they're farming, of course, organic, of course, in a natural way, but especially if they also do it with ritual that they believe in. Not if it's performance, then it doesn't work. <laughs> like in China, they do it, but it's because it's just performance for tourists. But if it's real, true prayer, real ritual, 
and the people feel connected to it and it means something because it also connects you to, again, culture, right? It's a story that you are a part of. Then you're happy <laughs> because you're a part of this big thing. And so that's in a nutshell. Of course, that's another big topic that would take, you know, three lifetimes to really talk about. And I'm still learning myself. What do I know? I had no ritual farming growing up. I'm just trying. But I believe it's something of value. And, and I think, well, again, with educate, this, it's all connected, everything we're talking about. I don't think you can have an education without knowing how to farm. That's the ultimate. You got to farm. And there has to be some sort of spiritual element. Otherwise, there is no culture, right? And so this, I would say, re re relates to every element of, of life, but especially to farming. So that's ritual farming, I guess. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm not doing it justice. Need to talk about that more. Sing some song. <laughs> but yeah, it's special. You can see in India, no? I see really beautiful in India. <laughs> I mean, this is a lonely path for sure. And most people don't get it, you know? Um, especially when you start talking about ritual, you know? I mean, it's one thing to be a farmer or organic farmer, but when you really start looking at like culture and like ritual, it's a lot of work and people are lazy <laughs> and uh, it's, it's hard because we're all conditioned to, to think a certain way, to laugh at jokes that aren't funny. We're all a, a product of like a weird modern way of seeing reality. That's very strange. And um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I feel really lonely, <laughs> but no, I never want to go back because I'm, I'm, I'm very clear about being in love with the earth. And I'm very clear about what modern society is doing to the earth. I don't want to be a part of that, you know? And so, no, I have no desire to be a part of that. But sometimes when I see people, it's so easy for them to find friends and like, they seem happy. Sometimes there's a little bit of me like, oh, you know, maybe I should just start watching TV again. <laughs> but it only happens for like two seconds. And then I, I hear the birds and nah, no way. 